Bloody Pen Podcast. Chapter 7 Some Kind of Animal Joe woke up naked and on the floor. Bewildered, he sat upright and unsteadily scanned the messy room. Kiltitz was propped up in his bed, watching something incredibly violent on the last remaining unbroken TV in the apartment. The sounds of modern warfare filled the room. To Joe, it felt ominous. What happened? You slept too long is what happened, and now I'm hungry, she barked. Go make me another pea butter witch of the sands. Unsure if this was a test, he ventured. A peanut butter sandwich? Yes, that. Make three. She dismissively waved her hand without pulling her purple eyes from the action. The queen seemed to be studying whatever horrors flitted across the screen. And something for yourself. Automatic gunfire and horrendous screams blared from the tiny speakers. Got him! She pumped her fist like a teenage girl rooting for her favorite team. Momentarily distracted by her outburst, it suddenly occurred to Joe that she must have placed him on the floor after they had sex, then slept on the bed alone without him. So, for the first time since they met, her highness had royally pissed him off. There was something in Joe that clicked right there. Something buried and all but forgotten. His true nature stirred as he stupidly stared off into space. Coming back to Earth, his first thought was to immediately stop taking shit from this crazy broad. He made her, not the other way around. Where was the gratitude for being able to take part in the miracle of existence? Where was all the giddiness and potential thank you sex? The way Dickhole figured it, she already did her worst, and he hadn't a single scratch on his person. Sure, the ferocious female had trashed his place, but the damage was already done. What's the worst she could? The last TV Joe owned smashed as it was met with the remote. Both the gunfire and the screams abruptly silenced themselves. Food! Now! He then did what any asshead might do in his position. Still completely naked, he stood in front of the deadly, magic-wielding warrior queen from space and gamely told her to shut her royal mouth. You need to shut the fuck up. He was careful to enunciate and projected his voice a notch above polite while he attempted to master the fear billowing up in his guts like an impending storm. Temporarily incapacitated by anger, she stammered for a moment before giving him one final chance to locate the respect she demanded from all living beings, especially men. I am a queen, you little... No, really. You can stop talking now. I've heard plenty from you this morning. Don't you remember what we did last night? And why didn't you clean yourself up? I can see it from here. As he spoke, she took inventory of the various stains upon her person. The bathroom was right there. You could have washed. Bathroom? She interrupted, looking in the direction of the distinctly visible sink. Right. The room with the bathtub in it. The bathroom. Oh, a bath does sound nice. Go fetch hot water and fill it for me, she ordered. Slowed by confusion, he explained. Yeah, I have running water so I don't have to fetch anything. You really didn't know about that? He fearlessly continued. Haven't you had to pee this whole time? Unsure of the answer he was looking for, she admitted, I did think it was strange you didn't have a pot in your bedchambers. She shrugged her toned shoulders. Most do. As she said it, Joe's eyes were drawn to the dark spot on the wall where Kiltits had obviously urinated during the night. There was a sizable puddle on the floor as well. Forgetting all traces of protocol, he raised his voice at her for the first time. The toilet was right there. Even if you did think you needed a pot to piss in, why didn't you fucking go get one in the kitchen? She looked baffled. I'm a queen. I don't frequent kitchens. That's a lot of piss. She shrugged again. That's how much I piss. Joe threw his hands up and his eyes squinted themselves into the most patronizing look his face could produce on short notice when he finally crossed the line with her. The fuck is wrong with you? Who does that? What are you, some kind of animal? Her sword was out before he could tuck his away, and to Joe's complete horror, he merely watched in slow motion as the blade contacted the tip of his penis. <laughs> Bracing for his worst nightmare come true and the horrendous pain to follow, he looked away as a deafening ping rang out which forced Kiltits to drop the sword and cup her ears while Joe fell back onto his ass. Slowly, she sat up in the ringing silence which followed as he nervously checked on his best friend. The queen looked stunned as Joe jumped around the room like a drunken kangaroo, cheering, It's fine. The admiral is totally fine. Ha ha, did you hear that? Holy shit, my ears are still ringing. Sadly, she looked down to her sword, which was laying on the ground for the first time that she could remember. Kiltitz waved it from existence and loudly sighed. In a defeated gesture, she slumped back against the bed and slid to the floor while Joe celebrated for some time. The ass even stood before her while he jutted and proudly flexed like an immature moron. Joe, I... Don't call me that anymore. Call me Ironcock. Ha <laughs> ha. It's clearly not iron, she pointed out.
but the magic around it seems to be impenetrable. Besides, iron would have lasted longer in bed. Embarrassed, he owned it. True, but to be fair, it's been a while for me, and you are the sexiest woman I've ever seen. Don't worry, I'll get there eventually. It'll just take a bit of practice, okay? He took her hand and bent to kiss it in a half-mocking, half-genuine gesture of servitude. Forgive me, my queen. She rightfully suspected the simple human had never lain with a woman of her caliber, so his admiration and newfound respect was most likely sexual in motive. It had nothing to do with her skill as a warrior, nor as a sorcerer, or even a ruler. In her mind, these were her three best traits, with her angel-like face being fourth, and her outrageous body fifth. She was understandably offended by the mix-up in this order, and regained her queenly tone with him. Oh, so now you respect me, but not when you give me this absurd body or branding me with a ridiculous name. Why curse those you claim to admire or care for? Why make someone if you don't at least want them to be happy with their lives? Not really hearing her, Joe jumped onto the bed and gently dragged the bridge of his nose along her belly. Of course I want you to be happy, sweetheart, he cooed. You're the queen for a reason. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I think you were designed... He pushed his forehead up and smushed it into her underboob. Perfectly. From under her breast, he smiled up at her like a raging imbecile. Childish as he was, the queen found something about him to be mildly entertaining. On some level, she even appreciated the way he looked at her. And if she was being honest with herself, the feeling of his hands on her skin wasn't too terrible either. Compared to hers, his strength was laughable. He behaved like an overgrown child, and he carried about his stupid self an air of masculine dominance she hadn't encountered in ages. Her mind jumped back to the conversation in time to hear him say, and as for the name Kiltits, maybe I did rush that one a bit. He migrated south and began kissing her belly in a dotted line. I just don't want to change your name now though, okay hon? It'll confuse the readers. Kiltits pulled an innocent face and asked through pouty lips, readers? Yeah hon, the readers, the folks I made you for, the other half I call them. There aren't many right now, but I think that's just because her finger casually hooked onto his lower jaw and yanked him towards her by the teeth until he was close enough to count the stains. Begin to make sense, or I will spend the rest of the day figuring out a way to harm you. You're a character in a story I'm writing, he garbled. People read about you. Well, now I'm in your world, she let go of his jaw. Okay, what's your point, bub? Who's writing you, Joe? Are these readers also reading about you since I'm here now? He pulled a contorted face at the question. As he began to form a query of his own, the doorbell rang. They looked to each other, then back to the door, then back at each other again. Joe, being equal parts foolish and decisive, broke the cycle first. What if I call you KT, short for kill tits? Would that be better, my sugar cookie? Surprisingly, KT liked being called someone's sugar cookie. The sugar part was in reference to the queen's gleaming white skin, which had always made her self-conscious in the past. But when Joe likened it to sugar, a powder she discovered was a principal ingredient in the making of peanut butter, her new personal favorite, she found the comparison endearing. The cookie part was about sex, which in KT's eyes was also quite a nice thing too. I like that, she quietly answered. KT sounds much better than kill tits. Thank you, Joe. Her gratitude surprised her when she realized she meant it. Regrouping, the sorcerer switched gears. There's something extremely powerful outside. Can you not feel it? Indeed, Joe could feel it. He thought he might faint from panic or vomit or shit or a combination of the three. He wasn't sure but he really didn't want to look stupid in front of his new lady, so he kept it together the best he could. There seemed to be a tremendous energy coming from just beyond his front door, which made him sick. I guess I should answer it? Drawing her sword from the air, she stooped into a crouch and calmly responded, I guess you should. The immortal on the other side of the door waited for a good while before he rang the bell a second time. He was in a tremendous hurry, but didn't feel the need to be pushy about it. Okay. Here we go. Chapter 7 in the books. Uh, Katie and Joe hooked up. Katie's still treating him as though he is a peasant. Uh, he oversteps his bounds with her, and she attacks him. And thankfully for Joe, uh, it doesn't work. She's unable to harm him. So that's where we're at right now. We're at uh, Chapter 8 of Unkillable Joe. Chapter 8. A Pact Broken. As it turned out, Batricus was quite the prodigious pupil. He managed to raise an undead hand within his very first lesson, and could completely control it after just a few short hours of practice. The dusty demon was astonished at the achievement, but made no mention of it. His student was unnatural, so what was there to say? Fear ran its fingers down his very, very old spine. There was something about this bite-sized battle mage that felt dangerous. Not only that, the snake bites on the frog's sides were already visibly healed. The skeleton took note. This was no ordinary frog indeed. 
The connected pile of bones realized the amphibian's regeneration abilities were unlike any creature he had ever seen before. As interesting as he found the physical anomalies of the hairy frog to be, it was the intense focus and unbreakable concentration of Batricus which fascinated him most. The fledgling necromancer was learning at an unbelievable rate. He never requested a single break, either. It was as if some unseen force was somehow driving him through the study of dark magic. The damp and timeless feeling of the cave came alive with an electric charge of sound and possibility. To the local residents, Batricus's training sounded much like the music of battle, but to those passing through, it was more like a warning to move faster. Something significant happened that day. The skeleton could feel it in his bones. It was during the lesson where he showed the frog how to launch shards of sharp bone from any natural surface that he saw something even he couldn't comprehend. The ancient just explained to his student that one had to mutter a code word representing an incantation in order to cast the spell. This, he pointed out, needed to be repeated each time. One mutter would produce only one shard, so it behooved the combat mage to learn how to speak quickly and to look after his vocal cords well, for a wizard's voice was his lifeline in battle. Aim also helped, he added, so it was important to keep a line of sight on the target. As Batricus practiced this technique, the ancient quickly noticed his apprentice had stopped saying the words out loud and could silently cast the shards at will. More and more, bone slivers began to whiz and zip through the air as they were flying so fast that the interior of the cave rained white. A colony of bats took flight in an attempt to escape the terrible storm, but most were cut down by the tiny wizard's onslaught. Spatters of blood and bits of wings and little furry snouts showered and coated every exposed surface. The flurry continued to pummel the bones that lay on the ground until they were reduced to a powder-fine dust. All the while, the frog never made a sound, nor uttered one syllable. Flabbergasted, the demon saw his apprentice even shut his eyes. For being who was rarely excited about anything, the living collection of bones was exhilarated beyond his usual limits. Within this small creature was a true unbridled power. Old Bonehead didn't know how it was possible, but he reasoned that with the right training, this frog could become one of the greatest necromancers who ever lived. Batricus composed himself and calmly turned to his trainer. The demon was burning to know why he crushed the bones into dust with his last spell. They could have been useful if kept intact. Why did you... His student silenced him with a little fist raised and the frog refocused. Rotted hands emerged from the roof of the cave. They clasped together in a line and provided a path for the dripping water to follow. Batricus slowly lowered his arm, and the final bony hand in the rotted chain tipped itself towards the ground. As the water came in contact with the bone dust, the soil sprung to life and glowed in a deep, toxic green. It only took a few drops for the powder to animate and absorb with a sharp hiss. The sludge fizzed and reacted, but after a short time the majority of the white talc was all but gone. Batricus opened his eyes and casually explained, By reusing the material... I can now repair the damaged pieces on the fly. How he knew this was anyone's guess, but it was beyond what the demon had taught him so far and then some. At that, the unusual frog summoned a gleaming white arm, which immediately flew towards his teacher. The master countered with a conjured arm of his own. In comparison, it looked heavily decayed and thin, but it caught the bulging bicep midair and held it firmly in place. Very good, he hissed in encouragement. That's when a much larger arm materialized. It was braided with heavy muscle and seemed to be free of all rot. The newcomer seized the smaller arm by the elbow, gave it a violent shake and snapped it into two parts, which wistfully fell to the floor. Without uttering a single syllable, Batricus flicked his finger and the dismembered limb launched itself forward and crashed into the wall near the skeleton's skull, leaving a round, frog-sized hole in the stone. Batricus politely excused himself as several perfectly formed glowing hands smoothly carried him to the new cubby. Surrounded by the new and upgraded guardians of the cave, this was where he made his bed for the night. The heaviest arm pressed its palm to the opening to give the frog a measure of privacy and security as he slept. Never in the history of necromancy was a mastery of that level achieved in such a short amount of time. The skeleton sat motionless throughout the night, frozen in disbelief at the realization. It was on the third day of instruction when the wolverine frog was taught how to spray a cone of concentrated fire from his hands. It was a powerful offensive spell, best used to take out multiple enemies when in close quarters. He was told that it burned hot enough to incinerate most living matter and even bone. Almost immediately, the poised apprentice was able to focus the flame throughout the entire length of the cave, which measured just over 30 feet. Impressive, remarked the skeleton. I'm sure I could go farther. I'd like to try outside now. And so you shall. The demon appeared to be in his own way, smiling. Your training is now complete.
But the frog felt cheated. We've just started. There must be more you can teach me. I couldn't have learned it all that quickly. Ah, but I'm afraid you have. He bent forward with a loud crack. I've never known much about magic. But you insisted we trade my knowledge for your soul. You now know as much as I do, so... Anger welled up inside Batricus. He could feel it in his little frog hands. The magic you've shown me is great, but in time I could have learned it all of it on my own. He made a last attempt to reason with the morally bankrupt fiend. A few lessons can't be worth an entire soul. In this case, he extended a withered, fleshless arm to punctuate it. They were. The statement hung heavy in the air. I will take my payment, eventually. The newly anointed summoner stiffened at this decree in a more formal attitude. He thanked the ancient for the lessons and for granting him temporary asylum from the snake. The skeleton bowed and thanked him in return for the fresh soul. Without warning, Batricus raised his little hands and incinerated the demon with an intense flame that burned for a long, brutal minute before he finally called it back. When the thick smoke dispersed enough for the frog to once again see clearly, the ancient skeleton was nothing but a pile of gray ash. Now, the frog said to no one, my training is complete. He gathered a few handfuls of the remains and fashioned himself a small pouch to put them in. Once it was affixed to his waist, he had a quick drink and prepared to exit the cave. The pact had been broken, but the fledgling summoner felt just fine about it and pushed the thought from his mind. After all, it was his soul to gamble with, and he refused to apologize for being victorious. Whew. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 done. Good God. So that's Patricus, guys. That's a wolverine frog who has um, taken temporary asylum from a snake in a cave where there seems to be a very old bone demon waiting for him. And um, rather than just quickly kill him, the bone demon becomes fascinated by him and ends up... Uh, the frog convinces him to teach him how to uh, become a necromancer. So there you go. So Joe hooked up with Katie and Seven, uh, and they're having a little some issues there. And we find out that Joe is uh, sh Katie's unable to kill Joe, and Batricus has now murdered his uh, teacher. So that's where we're at. Pretty crazy. But thank you guys for hanging out and. Um, Following this uh, along, you can purchase Unkillable Joe on Amazon in paperback. It is gorgeous. The cover is beautiful. Designed by my manager and lady, uh, Lily Aurora. She did a fine job. I really love the cover of this book. I can't wait to have a whole bunch of little book babies on a shelf, and they all have pretty covers. This is gonna be this is gonna be a great thing for me. So. Uh, again, thank you for hanging out. Thank you to everybody that subscribed. Thank you for everyone that's uh, liked, commented, and shared the podcast. You guys are amazing. Uh, if you're a creator, if you want to appear on the show, hit me up. And uh, other than that, we will see you next time for chapters 9 and 10 of my book, Unkillable Joe, on the Muddy Pen Podcast. 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 Yes, yes, yes.